Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar on moving to or living in France, part of a series covering several countries sponsored by global wealth management company Blevins Franks. And if you're not sure what a global wealth management company does or why you might need their expertise, then that should become apparent as we navigate the financial considerations when leaving the UK and setting up your new life in France. We'll also be delving into the world of visa requirements for France and explaining the steps to establishing residency. So first up, let me introduce the experts we have along today to help us through uh, all of these issues. First of all, Tracy Leonetti from LBS in France. Hello, Tracy. It's good to have you here. Why don't Hi. you kick off by telling us a little bit about yourself and the services that you provide? Wonderful. Yes. Uh, hi, Andy. Great to be here today and hopefully answering a lot of questions for the viewers uh, today. Um, so, yes, Tracy T LBS. Uh, we are a relocation company based in the south of France. Uh, I personally have been in the south of France for 30 years and married with two children. So I have been through all the processes possible to live in France. And that is why I set up my business 10 years ago to help people like yourselves who are watching today navigate the rough waters of the French administration system. We, can, we help people from anything to do with visas, immigration, healthcare, driving license, car registrations, property problems, anything really, really related to their move to France in the hopes that you have a smooth transition and it's less painful that is what we do removing the pain that's a good thing to do exactly. and is it fair to say that uh, your services are kind of more required post brexit because there are a, a, a number of issues that people need to get over i mean it's still an achievable uh, aim isn't it it's just there's a bit more of a process around it yeah, I mean, when I came to France 30 years ago, the UK was not part of the EU and I started from scratch way back when with the whole problems of visas and so we've come full circle effectively. But yes, uh, I still believe in, in the dream life in France. That's what we do. However, there are more hoops to jump through than there was before. It has become more, more complex. But LBS was created before Brexit. Therefore, we have lots of experience dealing with non-Europeans and the issues that they obviously face okay thank you tracy well more on that uh, coming up simon simon Everly from blevins franks why don't you tell us a bit about yourself uh, blevins franks as a business and the range of services that you provide to uh, british relocators yeah thank you andy um yeah i mean the services we offer very much dovetail with the sorts of services that tracy offers we're uh, we're a firm of uh, wealth managers so we look after people's investments, the tax planning aspects of moving to France, um, helping people to, again, as Tracy said, make things as easy and simple as possible when they're in France and making things are done in a, in a logical order so that the tax planning that needs to go on on the English side of the channel is done before you arrive and the bits that need to be done this side are done after arrival rather than the other way around when you could get in a bit of a mess. <laughs> Right. OK, well, lots to get through today. And for everybody who's watching, thank you for coming along. We will be sending you a recording of this webinar uh, afterwards by email. Um, if you'd like to send in a question to put directly to Simon or Tracy, then please do. There is a question panel at the bottom of your screen. If you click that, uh, you can input a question and it will come through and we will try and get through as many questions as we possibly can. Now, We've built this webinar as uh, people making a permanent move to France, and we do need to stay uh, loyal to the core subject of the webinar. But just before we do that, Tracy, for anybody who is still in doubt, could you explain the single biggest change that's come into effect post-Brexit in terms of people having a holiday home in France and the time that they can spend there? Yes, absolutely, Andy. Um... Of course, the majority of clients want to move over permanently, but for the people who have second homes uh, due to Brexit, I think one of the biggest problems that they are encountering and, and the, one of the biggest reasons they reach out to us is because they can no longer have that freedom of movement. Whereas pre-Brexit, they could go pretty much as they pleased within the tax uh, frames, of course, um, and there was no formalities. Now, unfortunately, they're having to really count the days that they're in France or any other EU country for that matter. Um, so they're having to go through the 9180 rule effectively. So that freedom of movement has been completely restricted. 
So that that ninety one eighty, what does that look like, Simon, in in practice? Um, but in practice, it's it's basically um, every morning you wake up and day one hundred eighty one falls out of the equation for calculating how long you've been in France. You're not allowed to stay in France for more than ninety days in any rolling one hundred eighty day period. So uh, on the face of it, it's fairly simple, but you need to uh, you know, think back, when did I arrive in France? What have I done in the meantime? Um, so, and it's not quite as easy as all that. And people think, oh, I'll stay for 89 days, leave, and I can come back for another 89 sometime in the future. But that future is actually uh, at least three months in the future. Um, so you just need to be aware of the ins and outs and when you come into the country when you leave the country and don't forget of course your, your passport is stamped when you arrive in france now um so the big brother does know yeah okay so th this is primarily an issue for for a holiday homeowner who might want to go for four months in the winter they no longer can they could go for three months but then they'd need to leave a three-month gap before they could come back to france or indeed any other uh eu member country so uh, as I said, today's seminar, today's webinar is about people making a permanent move, which is different again. And again, with you, Simon, even pre-Brexit, anybody staying more than 180 days would ultimately become a tax resident in, in, in France. I think I'm right in saying now this is a completely Correct, different yeah. thing, and this is what we're going to explore today. So talk us through what that means in basic terms as you can to begin with. Certainly, yeah. Um, yeah, as you say, if you spend more than half the year in France, then you will be deemed to be French tax residents. Um, there are local rules, both in the UK and France, about what makes you tax resident. And it is perfectly possible under local rules to be deemed resident in both countries at the same time. But of course, you can't be resident in two countries at the same time. So we, we refer then to the double tax treaty between the two countries to determine um, which country can tax you. Um, but in essence, it is if you're spending most of your time in France, then you are tax resident in France. And the crucial thing is to make sure that you do that through planning rather than inadvertently falling into it and then finding that the planning you should have done six or 12 months ago, it's a bit too late, which is obviously where we we come in and where Tracy comes in. OK, so so. Tax resident then, again, this might be a new concept to people, you know, they've lived all their lives in the UK, they're planning to move to, to, to France. This is as basic as meaning that you then pay France, the state of France, your tax liability rather than paying the UK state. So all of your tax liability is suddenly in a different country, is that correct? Uh, no, if only it were that simple. Um, you, again, I refer to the double tax treaty. Um, you are resident in one country, um, but if that country has a double tax treaty with the country from which you're drawing income, then that tax treaty determines where that income is taxed. For example, in essence, if you're living in France, you're resident in France, you're paying tax here. But there are certain forms of UK income which will remain taxable in the UK. And the main two are rental income in the UK and civil service pensions. Uh, they remain taxable in the UK under the terms of the double tax treaty. The rest of your income would then be taxable here and be careful the things that are currently tax free in the UK may end up being taxable in France, for example, ISAs, they would just be treated as an investment portfolio in France and would be taxed, whereas they're obviously tax free for people living in the UK. So this typically this is where Blevins Franks um, uh, would explain their expertise because the, the ISA then is a is, is a tax beneficial product designed for the UK tax system, Absolutely. whereas you're now coming under the French tax system. So it's it's just a, it's just an asset and taxed accordingly under ASIC tax regime of the French French jurisdiction. Very much so. And the, the real sting in the tail is that uh, if you choose to keep your ISAs and then sell them two or three years after arriving in France, the capital gains tax calculation is not done from the point you arrived in France. It's done from the point that you originally invested, which could have been 15, 20, 25 years ago. Uh, and there could be a huge tax bill there. So uh, generally speaking, we say to people, you need to get that looked at before you leave the UK, because you may be missing a massive tax planning opportunity. Right. And, and there the advice would be, I guess, with something as black and white as that, the advice would be quite simple to divest of that UK tax efficient asset before you become officially tax resident in France. In general, yes, of course, you know, each individual circumstances are different, but in general, we'd say, yeah, it's better to do that than reinvest in something that may look a bit like an ISA, but works for the French taxman. 
So, so when do you start speaking to people ideally? Do you, do you find that, because um, I know you also work with people who are already resident in France, do you, do you find some people are almost a bit too late in the day become aware of a tax liability that they could have avoided if they'd have, if they'd have planned this whilst they were still a UK tax resident? Well, it's certainly true to say that the sooner we can be talking to people, the better. Um, and people who do that planning before they leave the UK will be in a better position. Um, but having said that, people who are already in France, we can still advise them. Uh, it may be trickier for us. It may mean that they have higher tax liabilities than they would have done if they'd done the planning sooner. Um, but yeah, we can, we can help people who are already here or on the way here. But speaking to the audience here, if you're thinking of moving to France, I would say get that planning done before you make the leap because you'll probably find yourselves much better off as a result. So are there things like ISO equivalent products in France that one could then divest of in the UK and move that money and invest uh, in a similar type of product in France? Certainly, there certainly are. I mean, they don't look just like ISOs, but if, if the idea is to have a, uh, an investment portfolio with a wrapper around it that uh, shelters it from taxation, then yes. Um, and the main vehicle used by most French investors and indeed by most Brits arriving in France is what they call an assurance fee, which is a life assurance wrapper around your money. Um, in essence, it is just an investment portfolio with a tax privilege wrapper around it so that uh, you get something that looks a bit like an ISA. OK, and you, 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 rent, you, you mentioned rental income uh, yeah. being uh, tax payable within the UK. That doesn't mean you, you pay it there and then you're taxed on that also in France, does it? That's because of the double taxation treat. You just pay the tax on it in the UK and that's that. Yeah, uh, again, <laughs> you ask a simple question, you never get a simple answer. Um, yeah, you are taxed in the UK on that rental income, you need to show it on your French tax return. The French don't tax that money directly, but it can have the effect of pushing other income that is taxable in France up the scale because they take account of that uh, rental income, even if they don't directly tax it, if that makes sense. I see. So you, you're being taxed on your... on. Well, you're not being taxed on all of your global wealth, but your global wealth is being taken into account. Absolutely, yeah. In establishing your 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 tax exposure uh, in France. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And what about we've we've done the, um, these webinars with your colleagues in uh, in other territories because Blevins Franks has uh, offices uh, in multiple jurisdictions, and I think it was particularly the one in Portugal where one could be liable for capital gains tax on a UK property if you moved and became a tax resident in Portugal? What, what's the situation in France? Oh, it's the same here, that um, your, your home in the UK, obviously while you're living in the UK and it's your, your main home, it's totally free of capital gains tax if you decide to sell it. The moment that you set up home in France and therefore France becomes your principal residence, your UK house is deemed to be a second home. Um, and uh, if you sell it a few years after arriving in France, the UK will look to tax you for the period when it wasn't your main home, um, but also France will ta potentially tax you. There will be a credit given for any UK tax you might have paid. But the problem with the French, again, going back to the idea of the ISA, it's not from the point you arrived in France that they'll be looking at any gain in value. They'll be looking from the very beginning, even though for the majority of that time it might have been your main home. The French don't give you any credit for that because it's the situation of the property at the moment you sell it that counts under French law. Right. So again, if, if you'd sold that before you became tax resident and benefited from the uh, the, the UK regime, you you pocket the equity gain and, and you would be fine. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and it's a conversation we have frequently with people. Um, they, uh, they want to keep a foothold in the UK. Um, but often they will say, well, we don't need such a large property. It's good to you know we can sell that free of any tax now, reinvest in a smaller property that we can go back to when we want to go into the children and the grandchildren. Um, but if you don't do it, then you are potentially uh, facing a, a big tax bill sometime in the future. If you then decide that you don't need that big house, in actual, type, actual fact, every time you go back to it, it's more hassle than it's worth. Um, you could have, uh, could have stored a big tax problem up for yourselves in the future. Right. OK. Um, Tracy, a lot of Simon's clients are uh, presumably retiring to France and planning a, you know, a life without, without work, without income. What, what, are the, what are the visa options then for uh, this type of uh, relocator post-Brexit? 
Um, yeah, I just want to just say, uh, come back to what Simon said first, what about the planning, as he said. Sure. I think for anybody who's listening to this, planning is really important, both from a financial and paperwork perspective, because I certainly love to get hold of clients before they get here, so we can talk about all of the visa and the requirements at the same time, work hand in hand with our, our other partners like Simon, because this is where we can really dig down deep and find out what the issues are. So that's why I always say you have to have a planning consultation before you come to France because it avoids so many problems so uh, especially you know for people with tax and visas and immigration because a lot of people are under the mis misconception that they can come to France and apply for a visa once they're in France and that is not true but to come back to your question Andy on retirees and uh, what the options are for moving to France then one of the visas that is highly popular for retirees is the long stay visitors visa um, it's uh, coming out of the VLSTS. It's basically a visa for anybody who wants to come and live in France, but not work. And that is very important because once you are in France, you are not allowed to work. And that goes for anybody who wants to move to France. If you're thinking of working in France or have a business in another country, you have to work out the visa and immigration requirements. So for retirees, it's an easier process effectively because they're not going to be working therefore they just have to apply for a long stay visitors visa from the UK or from country of origin maybe not everybody is uh, British on this call uh, so you apply from country of origin and then you um, you you come to France with your visa and it's renewable in France two months before the expiry of the visa um, so the visa uh, the long stay visitors visa for retirees it doesn't you don't necessarily have to be retired receiving a pension uh, a lot of some people are early retirees living off their investment income but you do have to be financially stable to be able to prove to the authorities that you are not going to be a financial burden and you're not going to be a health health care burden so what form does that um qualification take in terms of proof of funds or uh, private health cover Yes, effectively, depending on the situation of the client, hence why I always say planning and getting a meeting beforehand is important. We put together a, a list of documents that can use for evidence to show that they're not going to be a bad. And of course, some people are in receipt of pensions, state pensions, but as we all know, state pensions in the UK are not very high and wouldn't meet, meet the revenue requirements of the minimum revenue requirements is, is what's commonly known as the SMIC in France. It's commonly known as what, sorry? The SMIC which okay. is the lowest earnings levels that you can possibly have to be considered as not being a liability financially. Therefore, the SMIC level has just recently gone up. It's, you're talking on a yearly basis, about 15, between 15 and 16,000 euros. I think it's about 1,400 euros a month now, net, not gross. I think it's 1,600 gross per adult. It's slightly lower if you're a couple. So these are the revenue, minimum revenue requirements. I often ask my clients to have more than that because of course uh, you don't want to be on the edge of a decision with the consulate. So, you know, generally speaking, we have to take into account what that revenue can can consist of and it might be retirement it could be private pensions there could be a certain amount of equity in there as well because it's good to show savings but the way the consulate looks at this is savings can be spent so you could have a huge amount of money in the bank account but then the next day buy a boat so although you might be uh, financially uh, rich in investments they do like to see revenue and they like to see regularity so sometimes you know drawing down on your investments for a period of month a few months before you apply for your visa is a good idea you may stop that afterwards for tax purposes but for the visa it's always a good idea so yes rental income is, is classed also as income so if you have rental income in another country or in the uk that's a good thing to show as well and yes private in private health care insurance unless you have access to an s1 if you have access to an s1 because you're receiving state pension then s1 um is acceptable in the place of private uh, health care, which is great because it can be very expensive otherwise. Just explain uh, what an S1 is then for people who don't know. Yes, so an S1 is basically, it's like a cross-border document. So anybody who's been living in the UK and have paid all of their social contributions in the UK and are then of retirement age, 
would receive um, an S1 from the D Department of Health and Pensions organisation. It's basically a document that proves that when you come to France, the UK will be responsible for your healthcare uh, costs. So it, it facilitates, if you like, the healthcare process for those people who hold an S1 because there is no liability on the French social security. Um, and that's why they will accept at the visa meeting um, an S1. So if you're of retirement age receiving a retirement pension, then S1 is the way to go. Otherwise it's private cover for the period of the visa. So did you say the visa is for year one? You apply for it outside of France, so within the UK or wherever you are based, and it's it's a visa for for a year. Is that correct? Or yes, effectively, it's a just for the, for the vocabulary purposes. A visa is usually what brings you into a country, and then you apply for a residency card or a cat séjour in French, as it's commonly known. Once you're in the country, the long stay visitors visa, the LSTS, is the the only visa that you can come into France with, and it stays in your passport for the first year, it, it, it becomes a residency card once it's stamped by the immigration office. And so you have no further action. And then once you get to two months before the expiry of that visa in your passport, then you would um, apply to your local prefecture in France to have a residency card. And then you would be delivered with an actual um, retiree uh, residency card, if you like. And just just briefly, if you would, then after year one, what is the next step to establishing, uh, if I've not got the vocabulary complete right, but formal residency? What does that look like? Uh, it's exactly the same. Really. For anybody who's got a visitor's visa, once they renew it the first year, each year they would renew it. It's a continual renewal every year. Now, after five years of continuous renewal, um, and of course, when I say continuous renewal, you need to have also continuous residency, which means, in my opinion, tax residency, much like Simon touched on earlier, residency is very much linked in France to your tax residency. If you want to be able to apply for a longer term card de séjour or residency card, then you have to show five years of continuous tax residency. And it's still at the discretion of the prefecture. So visitors visas often tend to just get renewed every year simply because there's no real investment in the country because you are not working. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got a question and it's actually anonymous, comes back to you, Simon, is about French capital gains tax on stock and other asset portfolios, do they assess unrealized capital gains tax if resident? Um, that not I mean, not if, it, if you haven't realized it, no. Uh, but if you, if you sell your assets, your portfolio while you're French resident, then yes, you will have to pay capital gains tax on the, uh, on the realized gains. But no, there's no tax on the unrealized gains. Okay, but were they to be realised whilst you were tax resident, then then yes. Yeah, uh, which is going back really to what I said earlier about ISAs, uh, which, uh, I mean, a normal stock portfolio would be taxable in both countries, but an ISA portfolio obviously is only taxable in France. It wouldn't be taxable if you were selling it in the UK. Yeah, and you, you mentioned about uh, pensions and state pensions. So state, there is a difference then between state uh, for, Pensions for, what did you say, for civil servants? Civil service, yeah. So civil service pensions continue to be taxed in the UK, but all of the pensions would then become taxed in, in France? Yeah, that's right. And um, the uh, difficulty, and we see it even with French accountants, the difficulty is that uh, the way it's described, uh, government pension, i.e. a civil service pension, and people would quite rightly think, well, government pension, that must mean the state pension as well. State pension is taxable here in France if, if you are... U UK state pension living in France is, is taxable here. Okay. The other income, private pension income, uh, company pension income, that's taxable here in France. Yeah, I see that confusing a lot as well in, with my clients is, is when they come across and because they have a lot of private pensions, of course, maybe in parallel to their state pensions, and they um, have not disattached from the UK tax regime. And oftentimes that causes lots of problems with tax declarations in France because they, they have this uh, miscomprehension because of the double tax treaty. Well, that's fine, I've paid tax in the UK, so I don't have to pay tax in France. 
And as you know, we say, well, actually, no, for those types of pensions, your pension should be taxed in France. You have to let the UK authorities know that you're no longer in the UK. So it does cause a lot of confusion, the, the language and the vocabulary that is used. And the double tax treaty itself causes a lot of um, confusion. So looking at a number of the questions that are coming in, I think uh, quite a few of those have been covered off by Simon and Tracy's uh, very clear explanation about where you are tax resident and your, your, your global wealth and where that is taxed. Um, we have a question in Tracy from Jan Young. Uh, this is a little bit out of, the, out of the scope, well, certainly out of the scope of retirees. She's asking if she could continue to run a UK company while living permanently in France. Would that require a work permit, even though the work is for a company, company in the UK? So um, she's working as an employee, did you say? in that well, company? The wording is, can I continue to run my company in the UK? Okay, so let, 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 let's assume that she owns the business. OK, so um, having a UK company, but living in France and managing it from France is not allowed without the correct visa. It's not because of this, you know, uh, possibility that we can work for wherever we want because of the technology nowadays that we can work from wherever we live. It doesn't mean that because you have a UK company, you can live in France. If you're in France and working for your company in France, then no, you have to have the appropriate visa for that. So a business visa, either transfer your business to, to France and have a liberal or talents visa so you can actually manage and live and work in France. But if you've got a UK company in the UK, coming to France um, and just having, you know, staying here a bit, then going back to the UK to work, that you can do, but you cannot work physically in France for a UK business without having the right visa. Okay, but yeah, she wouldn't have to very complicated. It's a very complicated scenario. Um, and uh, I, I, it's, you know, people don't understand how it works. They think they can, but no, you can't. So, but with the appropriate visa, she could continue to Absolutely. run her company. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You also mentioned, um, Tracy, about people uh, on today's webinar not from the UK, um, which is uh, always good to remind ourselves. Uh, Simon, we have uh, two questions from two people um, based in the US. Do, do you help uh, Americans get th through um, with, with global wealth management and taxation, or is that a jurisdiction out of um, your uh, Unfortunate, rebate? Unfortunately, we can't. Um, because as your uh, you as the US viewers will know, once you're in the grips of the US tax man, you are never let go. Um, and because of that, it is very difficult to advise US taxpayers. It doesn't have to be US nationals, it can be it can be foreign nationals who have a have a green card or have a have a US tax obligation. So unfortunately, no, we can't. And Tracy, what about Cheryl Waite? She's in the uh, US. Do you help Americans? I guess for you, the process of moving to France, it's it's almost, well, it's not irrelevant where they're coming from, but but it's the same set of services for third country nationals, non-EU non, non -EU members. Is that right? Oh, exactly. I mean, obviously, LBS, uh, my business was created in, well before Brexit happened. And thank goodness I didn't rely on the UK uh, for my business to be to flourish before Brexit. So uh, many of our clients before the British were Americans, Canadians, and still are. We have Americans, Canadians, a few South Africans, um, but mainly yeah, Americans, Canadians, and Australians who obviously go through very similar processes to the British now. Um, it's more the British have difficulty adapting to a process that exists already for the Americans and the other uh, third country nationals. So yes, of course, it's the same process, consultation, to really look at the information, to look at the situation now, see where the project is going, what is the long-term objective and find the right course for them to come to France. The same for Americans or for British. Okay. We should probably have uh, answered Jenny Gibbs' question earlier because we're now half an hour in and she said, is this webinar relevant for me? I'm a dual British and Dutch passport holder tracy ah interesting yeah so she's got a dutch passport then of course the dutch passport is still european therefore from a mobility perspective she has the same rights as any other european so not necessarily for from the visa perspective but of course when she comes to france if she has problems with healthcare, driving license and car registrations and things like that, yes, but not from a visa and immigration perspective. From a tax perspective, that's more for Simon, but yeah, she would still have 
process to go through, but not the same difficulties as obviously the non-Europeans. Yeah, and but Simon, just... then uh, an EU national then looking to um, look at tax efficient uh, regimes in France. Is that are they people you deal with? Absolutely, yeah. Um, because the uh, as Tracy said, yeah, the visa requirements aren't the same, but uh, the other issues faced are the same. Um, we will provide that advice. Our advice is always advice provided in English. So anyone who prefers to have advice in France in English, then we can do that. Um, there are certain restrictions depending on that on nationality regarding what we can and can't do. But um, I would always say it's worth having a conversation with us and we can uh, at least explore things and see whether we can help you or not. Okay, thank you. Uh, Danielle Wichen uh, asks, I'm French, my partner's British. We're in a French civil partnership, a PACSED. Mm -hmm. um, what, what's the impact on a visa for them, Trace? well, for, for the other half? So they're currently in the UK? Um, I, I, let's assume they are, because they're saying, what, what would be the impact on getting a visa? So, so if they've been paxed for more than one year and can prove that they have been living together as um, paxed couple, then the, the non-French uh, partner can apply to live in France with uh, attaching to the French partner. So that's basically the family visa because one of them is French and is paxed with their partner. So, but they have to be in PAX for at least one year to be able to do that and prove that they are living together with the correct documents showing living together. So yes, it facilitates the visa process if you are paxed or married to a French national. Okay, and Danielle, uh, also asks Simon, um, I'm not sure I've had this question before, if it's a UK pension but, but being paid into a French account and it's indexed against the cost of living, do you have yeah. any uh, uh, information on how that is then calculated? Well, the, U the UK, what, the UK state pension I'm assuming we're talking about, aren't we? Um, yeah, let's, let, let, let's assume well, that, I, yes. I don't think it makes much difference, but uh, yeah, it, the UK pension payer, be it the state or a, or a private company, if there is an inflation link or an index link in that pension, it will be determined by whatever the uh, the UK provider has determined is the, is the thing that they'll judge it against. Um, and then it will be paid across into their French bank account at the prevailing exchange rate. Okay. Um, and um, there's a term that's been kicked around at quite a bit at the moment. I'm not sure if there's any clear answer on it, Tracy. What, what do you say when people talk about digital nomads? Oh, gosh. I don't think that can really exist nowadays. I think it's very difficult to stay invisible. So, um, you know, you need to you need to do the, the, the proper paperwork. So, um, and I find that people are coming in stuck who haven't done it the right way for so many years because they could uh, but I, I think um, nowadays you'll find that when you do then try and put a footprint down somewhere it can come back and bite you on the bottom so um, and I've seen you know have people call me say no I've been living in France for 13 years I'd like to apply for citizenship and my first question is always okay where are you paying your tax Oh, I pay my tax in France. Okay, what type of tax? And they'll say tax habitation, tax means, yeah. And they'll say income tax. Oh, the UK. Well, then you're not a resident of France then, and therefore you can't apply for citizenship. So eventually, whatever your plan is long term, if you want to get a bank loan, you want to settle down, if you're, if you're not actually attaching to anywhere, they'll come back later on. Right, so okay, that's good, good advice. <laughs> not a good thing. Yeah. And um, Simon, we've, we've been talking about... Um, the implication of being tax resident in France, and uh, I hope we've made that clear to our to people on the on the webinar today. Um, but Fr France, I don't know whether it's fair or unfair, has a reputation of, as a high tax country. Um, what what do you say to people who might have that? Um, view? Yeah, I mean, it is true that France has a reputation for being a high tax country, and it is certainly true to say that if you are running a business, the cost of employment in France are high. Um, in general terms, for every euro that a worker wants to take home, it's, it's cost the employer two euros. Um, but 
uh, as far as individual taxation is concerned, no, it, it's, it's very manageable if you do the planning in the right order. And indeed, you may well find that you're slightly better off than you are in the UK, because unlike the UK, uh, it's the household that's taxed rather than the individual. So if in a couple there is a discrepancy between the, the levels of income, in the UK, one may be a higher rate taxpayer, whereas one's got very little income. In France, the whole, the whole pot of money will be lumped together and you get two goes at each tax band. So you could well find that your income tax liabilities in France are significantly less than they are in the UK. Okay, that, that, that's uh, that's interesting and, and will um, satisfy a number of people who are pinging in uh, questions to us. Um, let, let's move on to the subject of um, succession planning then, Simon. Uh, I know that's yeah. an area that Levins Franks gets involved in as well. Um, you know, might not be the most um, joyous subject on people's minds when they move to start a new uh, a new life in France, but it's an important it's an important thing to do. Just talk us through your advice or what, what you start talking about with people. Yeah, I mean, you, you're right. It, it's not necessarily a nice thing to have to face up to your own mortality, but um, it comes to us all one day. So uh, planning in advance is, again, a, a very sensible thing to do. Um, there are some very crucial things that people need to think about if they're moving to France. Um, and the first thing is that French law states that there are what they call reserved heirs, like children are reserved heirs. Children have an automatic entitlement to a part of a deceased parent's estate. How much they're entitled to depends how many children there are. Um, so writing a will and just saying, I leave it all to my wife or my husband doesn't necessarily work in French law. So you need to be careful with that. Um, and the other thing to say, the other major difference uh, to, compared to the UK is that in the UK, it's the estate that gets taxed. In France, it's the individual beneficiaries that get taxed and the allowances and the rates of tax they pay are determined by their relationship to the deceased. Just to give you a very simple example, children have a hundred thousand euro allowance from their parents um, and they pay, uh, they pay uh, about next half a million is taxed at 20%, and then there's another bit at 30%. And so the rates are manageable for children. If you go to the other extreme, if you leave money to, I don't know, the, the chap who's been doing your garden for the last 20 years because he's been doing such a good job, if you give him 10,000 euros, he'll get 1,594 euros tax-free and pay 60, 60% 60 tax on the rest of it. So the French state ends up with about as much as he does from your uh, your kind uh, legacy to him uh, because he's been been a good gardener. So there are ways around it. Um, and I mentioned earlier about an assurance fee policy, which is something that we use and that French people use quite a lot, because that also has some quite good, or very good uh, inheritance tax benefits for, uh, for people in that you can pass on a lot of money outside of your normal estate free of taxation or at a very beneficial rate. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you want me to go into great detail now, but uh, it's, uh, it's something that we use a lot for people and it's a very good way of, of avoiding or getting around some of these French issues. So that punitive rate is because the gardener's not a family member? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, right. I mean, if, yeah if, you, if you're paying your own son to do your garden, then uh, yeah, he, right. will, okay, he yeah. will benefit yeah. from the 100,000 allowance. Yeah. yeah. But um, so within the assurance V, there are that the, there is an option then to to divest to non-family members in a more tax efficient manner. Is that is that's primarily it? absolutely yeah. I mean, it, it, very simply, for investments that you put in place before the age of seventy, everyone that you nominate as a beneficiary is entitled to to up to one hundred and fifty two thousand five hundred euros free of taxation. So um, the, the 10,000 gift to the gardener could be included in an assurance fee policy and he would get it all, right, or she, sorry, shouldn't be sexist, he or she would get it all um, and uh, the tax man would get none of it. Right, okay. And, and so, same question to you then, is the, um, the reputation as a high tax regime in France. Tracy, what about, what about social charges, which we read about in France? Could you just explain yeah. broadly what they mean? Well, I mean, we could take a whole hour on social charges, right. but um, and I do find the reputation of, as you so rightly said, and as Simon said, you know, people do tend to think that the tax rates in France are high, and I think the reason that is because they confuse social contributions with yep. tax, even if it is obviously a form of tax, 
but and I think this is where the confusion lies because as Simon obviously so rightly say the actual income tax brackets can work out to be beneficial for certain households because it's worked on a household um, breakdown rather than individual assessment in the UK. However, where it does get expensive is, of course, the social contributions because everybody pays into the system in some way or form. And um, if you have a business, um, this is where it gets expensive, as you mentioned very briefly, businesses do pay quite a high um, cost because for every employee they have they pay practically the same again in in social contributions and for the healthcare system if you're entering the healthcare system it's not a free system it's not a free system at all and this is what I try and get across to many of my clients during the consultation is um, it's a system whereby everybody contributes in some way or form be that because they're working they have a business they they are residents who are not yet retired they would pay in via the puma system um or if you are retired yes you wouldn't pay to the healthcare, but you still pay obviously things like uh cds grgs i mean i forget all the, the little acronyms that we have in france there's about 13 of them so they pay into you know everybody pays something and certainly, you know, from a healthcare perspective, if you come into France and you want to, you think you're going to just take out private healthcare. So of course, you take private healthcare for your first year, depending on which visa you're going for, of course. And then you access the French healthcare system, and that is when you can you, you can pay a lot of money. If you don't have, if you're not working or have a business in France, then they will look at your investment income to see how much you have to pay into the system, and it can be uh, six point five percent of anything over and above. 10,000 euros from investment income. So that has to be calculated very, very carefully when you're moving to France as to which is the best way to go and what is the best way, what revenue to pull through on your tax declaration, because that is what they will look at effectively to work out your social contributions into the healthcare system. So I think the confusion on the taxes is because the, the contributions into the system is higher um, then the UK a lot higher, but then the system is also very good. The healthcare system is very good. So oh, and you yeah. you wanted to say better there, didn't you? I, I was going to say better, but I would say it's I very good. I see you stop yourself. <laughs> I tend to say you pay for what you get in the, in in anything. So um, although it's not perfect by any standards, it ha has a very good reputation, and you can um, access any kind of doctor usually. So you kind of pay for what you get. I think so. People have to prepare that where the tax system, the income tax system can work to their advantage if you have the right advice, of course, uh, and Simon's here to advise you on that. The social contributions is another side of, another type of tax that you cannot avoid, even if you want to. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, if, if you stay here for more than two years, then if you're a an early retiree living on investment income, then you will have some, some payments into the social contribution system. I think I'm right in saying that the French state raises more money from social charges than, than income tax, is that? Well, that is depends that... on if you have an S1 or not as well. Because uh, I mean, generally as a, as a, yeah. as, as a country that, um, that there's more money derived from social charges across the piece uh, rather than, ah, okay. than, than income know. tax. I, I, I couldn't answer that right. one. Uh, right, okay. I think that is, that is correct, Andy, yeah. Um, yeah. Because it, it, as I said earlier, the income tax charge is uh, rel relatively manageable. So, so to go back to your... Uh, retiree couple coming to France then and taking private health care for the first year and then looking to the um, the Puma that's Protection Universelle Maladie something yes. like that yeah yes. then yes. they they would be the state would take a view on their income not necessarily it depends what type of pension they're getting because if they're getting state pension then no it's if they're having if they're drawing down on private pensions investment okay. income so if I have a, you know, I don't know, a thousand a month on, on state pension, which usually doesn't usually go much more than a thousand euros a month on state pension, then that's fine. Because, of course, effectively, once you are a, a retiree, you have paid into a system for X amount of years. Therefore, you're not you're not paying into the healthcare system again. You would still pay the CR 
FDS and the CSG because that's the French debt and things like that. So you, even as a retiree, you would have a percentage that you would pay into the system, but you wouldn't pay again into the healthcare system because as a retiree, you've already done that. Of course, of course, you've got your S1 and you've your, got your S1, your, you wouldn't pay. However, fine, if you're a retiree living on, on entirely on capital investments, then that could have an effect, yes. Because even okay. if you're retirement age, but not receiving a state pension from any other country and living on, you know, your investment income, then that investment income could be put into the Puma, yeah. And do you have um, any indication of what healthcare charges might be for a typical typical couple or a typical person in that year one where they're taking out private cover? Is that just too broad a question to... Uh, well, the thing with, with private healthcare for the first year for retired moving to France, so let's say, for example, they're at the age of 65 to 70 um, and they're moving to France, they're on state pension, they've got the S1, they don't need the private healthcare. If they're between 65 uh, to 70 and they don't have that S1, then they have to take private healthcare cover out. You're talking probably an average of about, I would say for a couple, about 4,000 to 5,000 euros for that year. However, yeah. that can vary largely depending on their health, because of course some people have bigger health issues than others, and from the age of seventy onwards, again that that takes a start a, a starker increase because of the age. So yes, call, uh, we usually get quotations for our clients who are going through the visa process and who need to get private healthcare. So we help them and company through that process of getting the right healthcare in place, because of course it's important to get one that covers them in France. A lot of people have private insurance already, but unfortunately doesn't cover them uh, for the requirements of the visa. So that has to be done. So I would say on average about, you know, 5,000 euros, but please don't, you know, yeah. whip me down in fire if it's more. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Simon, Rob Elwood uh, messages in, um, potentially looking at a relocation to France following the sale of a business in the UK to buy a property and Jeep business in France. I guess a scenario you might have come across yeah. before. Um, should we talk to you for advice and guidance? Like, well, there's, there's a very short answer. Um, <laughs> and um, <laughs> the, the, looking to use some of the funds to buy the business and then the capital to live off um and then then revenue generated by the new business kind of what there's quite a lot there uh, you've helped people in that sort of scenario before i guess absolutely yeah um well he know, he knows exactly who he needs to be speaking to um i, I should have i should have said earlier when we were introducing ourselves that uh, we blevins franks are obviously present in france all over the country so uh, I'm based down in the uh, the south of France near Aix-en-Provence, but uh, if it's not me because he's not moving to my area, I have colleagues dotted around the country, and we can uh, we can find one of our people who will be able to help and advise him. Um, and if he is coming to the show next week, obviously I'll be more than happy to have a chat at the show. Good, good. Okay, well let's uh, let's mention the show for people that don't know. We have um, this webinar is brought to you by a place in the sun. We have a place in the sun live exhibition next friday saturday sunday 23rd to the 25th of september at the nec in birmingham my colleague katrina has just posted a link to tickets uh you can also go to placeinthesun.com forward slash exhibitions to get tickets or you can just turn up and get a ticket on the day we have about 85 exhibitors i think we have a special french area called the french village i know um simon uh, and other colleagues will be representing Levins Franks, Tracy, I believe you're along with uh, a well-known estate agent in France called Legit Immobilier. So we'll both be seeing you next week. I think you're both involved in seminars as well for uh, more of this sort of talk. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're on the same panel. We're on the we're on the same expert panel. I think Sam. I'm not sure who's yeah. Levins. Yeah. I think, I think we yeah. may be. Yeah. So yeah. If people can have more of us if they want more of us. More. more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Apparently, so. <laughs> Apparently they do. <laughs> I, I always feel it's important to say at this point that um, by their nature, these sorts of sessions can almost overwhelm people because they sound incredibly complicated. An awful lot of information's involved. There's different considerations because you're both immersed in the worlds in which you're immersed. You're giving out quite detailed information. People could look at all that and go, oh, my God, do you know what? I'm not going to bother. Um, but actually, this is just the sort of stuff that you need to get in place to make it work successfully, Simon. Is that, that, that do you share that view? 
Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I agree that uh, uh, whatever field we work in, we tend to uh, take it that uh, we fully understand it. So why doesn't everyone else? Um, but it's it's vital to talk to people and burying your head in the sand, whatever you're doing, never there's never a good solution to a problem. Um, so we hope that we when we're, we're talking to clients, we put think, ideas across in a simple, plain English manner so to make things understandable. Um, but I, I must say that you know, the fact that things are complicated is good news because it keeps me and my colleagues in a job. Uh, <laughs> if it was too simple, everyone would be able to do it themselves. But joking aside, it's, uh, it, it is important to uh, talk to people and get, and get your plans in place in advance. And as I said, don't bury your head in the sand because that will come back to bite you at some point in the future. Tracy, I guess uh, in terms of the visa side, of it, this is stuff people could do themselves if they chose to. Well, exactly. I mean, you know, um, some of the visas, you know, every, everything's doable yourself. Let's face it, if you want to do it yourself, you can always find the information. It's out there everywhere. The important thing, in my opinion, is to make sure that you're doing the right one for visas because there are different options. So I think it's more about understanding the long term objectives. That's so we do a, what's called a residency and relocation planning meeting up front with our clients to understand their objectives and then explain which process they will go through, what documents they will need, and the timelines for that as well. Because a lot of people are, are moving to France or to Europe and they're selling a house and they have the children to think about. So there's a lot of time sensitive issues going on. And that's where the the consultation comes in handy to help plan it out and get some clarity, really. Um, and, and really ease their mind that it can happen so long as it, you just have to plan and speak, as Simon said, to the right people. There's nothing to stop people moving to France. I did it 30 years ago with a five month old baby in the car and we, want, we were not part of the EU. So if I could do it with a baby five month old with no visa and I'm still here, I think everybody else can. <laughs> Wonderful, good. Um, and Simon, uh, Blevins Franks publishes a guide to uh, to France, I believe. Um, there's a, uh, you can email enquiries at blevinsfranks.com. I've seen a copy of that, uh, Simon, I'm sure you have. It's quite an extensive yeah. document, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, we, we publish a book that we update on a regular basis. We've actually, in the last couple of months, um, issued, I don't know what, what number issue we're at now, um, but uh, it's it gives a lot of information. Uh, we like to think it's a very valuable tool for people, but it will, as always, only uh, scratch the service and it won't uh, look at individual circumstances. So it, we like to think it helps, but you still need to talk to somebody once you've uh, gleaned a bit of information from our book. Sure. So you can make contact with uh, Blevins Franks again, enquiries at blevinsfranks.com or you can go to blevinsfranks.com website and under the news and guide section. You can download a copy of that as well and leave your details. We'll publish, if it's okay with both of you, Simon and Tracy, we'll, we'll publish your email addresses. Yeah. Should anybody like to get in touch with you oh, directly sure. to take anything further and if they're not able to get to the, uh, the NEC, but it's in the middle of the country, everyone can uh, can get to the NEC. Uh, so we're looking forward to a busy, a busy three days there. Thank you everybody for joining today. We uh, appreciate your interest. As I said earlier, please don't be put off by uh, what looks like a lot of detail. Just make sure you get it right. Speak to the right people. And thank you very much for your time, Simon and Tracy. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everybody. All the best. Bye-bye now.